you can't understand the important things from a distance. You have to get close. Those are the words of Brian Stevenson, lawyer, social justice activist, and author of the best-selling book, Just Mercy. I thought I understood the issues of violence affecting young people. I've worked in this field for 20 years, youth offending service, community safety teams, even as a pastor in a local church. I thought I understood the issues, the trauma, the pain, the suffering that families and young people go through when violence impacts their community. But it wasn't until the murder of a young man called Myron Yard in 2016 that I got a better understanding of that pain, that trauma, and that suffering. Myron is a young man who I had known uh, since 2000. I met Myron, first of all, at a community event in South East London. Uh, I remember it well. It was a sunny day. It was hot. There was food. There was music. And Myron was on the shoulders of his older sister's then boyfriend, who became a very good friend of mine, a smiley, cheeky child. Fast forward to 2016, and Myron had lost his life to youth violence. He was murdered in the streets of New Cross. At his funeral in the May of 2016, his best friend gave a eulogy. I will never get used to teenagers giving eulogies about other teenagers, but it was delivered with youthfulness, energy, and obviously sorrow. That was the May 2016. June, July 2016, Myron's best friend went back to his old school and spoke to his head teacher to say, I am struggling with my emotional and mental health. My best friend has been murdered. I'm struggling. Can you help me? The head teacher went to the local authority and went and spoke to the mental health services to see if there's anything which could be done. What she got in return was the waiting lists are too high. He doesn't meet the threshold. And more disturbingly, are you sure that he knows what he's talking about? That was the June of July. August 2016, Myron's best friend was stabbed to death in a house party in Peckham in South East London. There are many things that I will remember about that year, losing two young people who were best friends and the community impact and the trauma it had. But the two things I will remember about Myron's best friend's murders, firstly, where I was. I was 200 miles away in a lovely place called Norwich delivering and supporting and helping a youth event where 8,000 young people were from all over the country these kids came from. 2,000 of those kids came from London. When Myron's best friend was murdered, it was caught on the social media platform Snapchat. The aftermath of his murder was caught on Snapchat, which meant it went viral. And suddenly I had a safeguarding issue 200 miles away from the actual event. Pain, trauma, suffering, let's call that collective trauma one. The second thing I remember about Myron's best friend's murder was the funeral, which took place in the September of 2016 on a Friday afternoon. It was wet and rainy, and 200 children turned up in their school uniform. But there was only a handful of adults there. So suddenly you've got collective trauma too, all these kids with their pain, grieving, and nowhere to go. In 2018, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, surveyed 8,000 children, school children, and asked the question, what are your concerns, your main concerns for your neighbourhood and your school? 
the three things which came out for both of those environments, the concern, knife crime, being robbed, and gang crime for both school and neighbourhood. These are not challenging kids, this is your average child. Let's call that collective trauma free. The same year I was delivering a knife crime awareness session in uh, a local secondary school, and uh, a young man interrupted me and said, yo, big man, are you honestly telling me that when you see someone who looks like you, and you're walking past them, you don't think they're carrying a knife? And I'm like, no, I don't think that, because I try to see the best in people. And he said, well, I do, that's my reality. Me not believing that's true, asked the other 29 children in the class to see if that was their experience a mix of black and white and Asian kids, male, female, and all their hands went up. That is my experience as well. If I see someone I don't recognize, doesn't look like me, I'm assuming they're carrying a knife. Collective trauma. It's these experiences what got me thinking about what can we do when we are dealing with young people, how do we curate an organisation or a charity which addresses this type of stuff? How do we take the experiences on the ground of families and young people affected by violence and communicate that to policy makers, decision makers, local, central government, mayors, mayoral teams? How do you create this cycle of the experiences of the community, how do you then feed that into strategy? How do you make sure the resources gets put back into the community and then you have this co-produced, co-designed response? How does the air and the ground combine, very much like the water cycle? I learned so much from those experiences and others, but when I was launching my charity, I felt there were four things which really stood out. The first thing I realised is that practitioners, teachers, police officers, NHS staff are woefully ill-equipped to deal with the issue of violence affecting young people. So when I launched my charity, I wanted to train these practitioners in subjects such as violence against women and girls contextual safeguarding, county lines, all these things which we don't realise has a massive impact when we're talking about protecting young people and families. The second thing I realised is that there were many organisations who were doing brilliant work but don't necessarily have the platform to show their innovation. So I wanted to create a platform where that was easily accessible. The second or the third thing which I also realised in working with families and young people that in the immediacy of their pain and suffering, a financial gift actually alleviates some of this pain. And then finally, going back to Myron's best friend, they needed to be a new way of delivering therapeutic support for young people who are impacted by violence something which was what I would call more culturally sensitive and culturally humble than what we've currently got. It was this thought which actually led, when I launched my charity in 2019, to do some research funded by the Mayor of London to look into this. The Therapeutic Intervention for Peace report, looking at culturally competent responses to, to serious youth violence. The intention of this research was to evidence the experiences of young people, families and practitioners in order to improve the effectiveness of therapeutic responses to youth violence in London. We interviewed 102 young people, five families and 26 practitioners. And the re results and what we got were fascinating. Ten key findings. But what I really want to focus on 
is what we found when we interviewed those practitioners, family members, young people, was that there was a massive distrust of therapeutic services, particularly from black and brown minoritized communities. And just to be clear, I don't think youth violence is a black issue, but in the London context, it disproportionately impacts black and brown communities. There's a difference. So a lot of black and brown families were like, I don't trust these services because I've experienced systemic racism from other institutions, such as the police or education systems, and therefore I'm not going to engage with this therapeutic services. The recommendations from the report, we had four main recommendations. But what I want to focus on is the desire and need for a culturally sensitive conduit organisation being the glue between the community and the multiple institutions that we're dealing with, in this case, therapeutic services. What that looks like is that, as you can see, this culturally competent or culturally sensitive organisation in who's already got buy-in and trust with the community, being the glue between schools and local authorities and youth offending services and police, being that bridge, giving those experiences to those institutions, but having those trusted relationships with the community. It's about belonging, it's about inclusivity, who's been around the table to make those decisions. We believe it's a culturally competent on the ground organisations or culturally sensitive organisations on the ground which can do that. These findings then led to us actually delivering and piloting this therapeutic intervention for peace project in schools. We ended up working with three schools, 369 young people, 23 families, and also delivering 40 training sessions. The model's very simple. You have culturally sensitive therapists, counsellors, youth practitioners, psychologists, who look like the people who they're serving. Just, not just in ethnicity, but if you are white and working in a hyper-localised, hyper-racialised environment, are you culturally sensitive to work there? That's what we developed. And the results were mind-blowing. Children were suddenly engaging with therapists. The school environment changed. Kids were opening up. Their mental health and attainment levels were improving. Kids were happy to speak to therapists. It was fantastic. You can't understand the important things from a distance. You have to get close. We can no longer, if you are a teacher or a doctor or you work with young people in any way, just expect your qualifications to be enough. Are you culturally sensitive and aware about the communities and the culture that you are working in? Are you culturally humble? Are you prepared to take a posture of learning for the communities that you are serving? That is what we are seeing. That is what we believe is needed. You can't understand the important things from a distance. You have to get close. Are you prepared to do that. Thank you.